to see all of you here this morning. It's good, especially for us at Dr. Martin Luther Church, to have visitors with us. We hope that you're blessed by participating in the service. I know some of you are here uh, participating in the baptism and uh, sharing this wonderful moment with our congregation and with your family. And we pray your blessing, a God's blessing on you as you share in the service today. A few announcements. Um, first of all, these poinsettias are going to be going bye-bye after the day. So if any of you want to take one, I think there are five or six left somewhere around the church, please go ahead and take them and beautify your own home as they beautify our location. Let's see. If you kids, if you people can't find a place to sit, there's a, places upstairs you can find as well if, you, if that makes it uh, more convenient for you. What a nice problem, right? To have a big enough space for people to be seen. Um, next week, we are going to be having a town hall at 1135. This town hall is so important because it's where the congregation affirms the direction of the church as it searches for a new pastor. You're going to hear a mission exploration team report. This group has met for weeks, weekly, to prepare this document, and they're also going to be preparing a mission site profile, which uh, fills in some information for the Synod as they look for pastoral candidates for us. They need your input and reflection on what we've been doing. So please come at 1135, either in the church here, or if you'd like to watch it on Zoom, we'll be sending a link so you can see all of that on Zoom. There'll be monitors set up here, cameras taking it all in for you to participate. The bishop and the assistant to the bishop will be present by Zoom. They're the ones that are going to really listen to everything we have to say, so they need your, need your advice. I think those are all the announcements I need to make. It would help if I had the bulletin for the 1030 service, and I'll go get that. We'll figure this out. Uh, okay. For now, I just found one. I covered it. Did I tell you to fill out a participation card? No, please do that. Put it in the offering plate so we can contact you should be able to. Let's begin with the implication of the impression of the Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness refreshes all creation. Amen. Let's confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are our angel with all of our days. We confess that our hearts are burdened by our sin. We turn inward, failing to live in the light of your love. We think of ourselves and fail to consider the generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away. And we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's freedom and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. Holy God, creator of light and giver of goodness, your voice moves over the waters. Immerse us in your grace, transform us by your Spirit, that we may follow after your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. If you are able, we ask that you join us and stand with us in singing Holy Water. We know this is new for you, but we're going to do our best to lead you through this. So please join us in singing Holy Water. <laughs>
very special day in our life, the congregation. And I'm going to show you what's so special about it. Jamie, can you walk over here with me? This is the sister of Sophia and Deb. Can you see her? You know, she was born, I think, October 27th. How do I remember that? It's my oldest brother. So it's special. Now, we're going to have this service, and along the way, kids, I'm going to teach you some special things about this baptism and what it all means, okay? So, if you sponsors me back up a little bit so the kids can see this. There we go. That's perfect. In holy, in holy baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father liberates us from sin and death by joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are born children of a fallen humanity. In the waters of baptism, we are reborn children of God and inheritors of eternal life. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, which is the body of Christ. As we live with him and with his people, we grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will. So now, I'm going to introduce these people to you. And I'm going to have them move over here because they're taking the service. And this way we'll have a good uh, permanent video. So come on over this way, Jamie. And Justin, come on over. There we go. This is better. Now, I'm going to introduce you to these two people. This is Lucas and Cassandra. <coughs> Lucas is the cousin of the baby's mom, okay? And they are the sponsors. Sometimes they're called godparents, like godmother and godfather. And they are going to promise in just a minute that they're going to help pray for the baby, take care of Mia, give support to the parents, to Jamie and Justin, all along the way. So now, they have a big role to play right now. Are you ready? Go, oh, Lucas and Cassandra. Can you present me? In Christian love, you have presented Mia for holy baptism. You should therefore faithfully bring her to the services of God's house and teach her the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments. As she grows in years, you should place in her hands the Holy Scriptures and provide for her instruction in the Christian faith. That living in the covenant of her baptism, she may grow and lead a godly life till the day of Jesus Christ. Do you promise, parents and sponsors, to fulfill these obligations? Yeah. Will the congregation please rise? Now we have a long prayer in which we thank God for all the ways that God has saved us with water. Can you fold your hands, kids? Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, we give you thanks for in the beginning your spirit moved up the waters and you created heaven and earth. By the gift of water, you nourish and sustain us of all living things. By the waters of the flood, you condemn the wicked and save those whom you had chosen. You led Israel by the pillar of cloud and fire through the sea. Through the sea. Your son John was baptized by John and anointed with the Spirit. On this day we remember the baptism of our Lord. God made water a sign of the kingdom and cleansing and rebirth. In obedience to his command, we make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For out your Holy Spirit, so that Mia, who is here baptized, may be given a new life, wash away the sins of all who are cleansed by this water, and bring us forth as inheritors of your glorious kingdom. Amen. Now, the parents and the sponsors are going to say really loudly. <laughs> that they are turning their back on all the forces of evil, the devil, and false empty promises. Okay? Listen to them. I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, excuse me, <coughs> and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce all the forces of evil, the devil, and all his empty promises? We do. Why don't you do that? Do you renounce all the forces of evil, the devil, and all his empty promises? We do. Good job. Now, all of you, do you believe in God the Father? This is all in your book. 
That was sort of a weak profession of faith, and it's my fault for not giving you a heads up. Let's do it again. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now I'm going to baptize her three times. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Just clean my hands, real careful, okay? I baptize you, me and Marguerite, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I have a special little napkin that you should keep for to drive your cubicle. She sleeps so well. Doesn't she sleep well? Right for a bath. <laughs> and now I'm going to pray that the gifts of the Spirit are given to me. You always do this in a bath. Do you remember what I mean? I'm going to put my hands here, symbolizing the Holy Spirit being given to me. God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for freeing your sons and daughters from the power of sin and for raising them up to a new life in this hour. Pour your Holy Spirit upon me and Marguerite, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence. Now, here's a really cool part, please. This contains special oil prayed over and blessed. Because in ancient times, when a member of the priesthood or the king became a part of the leadership, they put oil on his head. And we're going to put oil. See how sleepy we're going to do this. It's going to be like right here. Me and Marguerite, child of God, who have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked across the Christ forever. Amen. Now there's another cool part a lot of fun to this, isn't it? Watch this. You get a baptismal candle, and me and Marguerite can light this candle on her birthday, her church birthday, which is January 10th. So she has two birthdays now. Now we say this, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. You can keep that burning to go back to the people. You can light it every year in January. Now there's another one for you guys. You ready? Through baptism, God has made his new sister, a member of the priesthood we all share in Christ Jesus, that we may proclaim the praise of God and bear his creative and redeeming word through all the world. And you, Sister We welcome you into the Lord's family. We receive you as a fellow member of the body of Christ, a child of the same Heavenly Father, and a worker with us in the kingdom of God. And now, can you bring me up? Let's sing a song. Jesus loves me. Yes, I know.
Thank you for coming. Talk to your whole family here. Children, you can go to Sunday school now. John the Baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed in camel hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie his thong with sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Here in the Gospel, you may be seated. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. You have something for me now. What do you got? You got a cough drop? Oh, you're the best. Okay. Perfect. Here's the sound pastors can't stand in church. They got some crazy. But when it's for them, they love it. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. When I was a college chaplain in Gettysburg College in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, I was at a, a party one night when a man came up and talked to me who lived in the country of Malawi, which is south of Tanzania, sort of central, east, south, central uh, Africa. And Malawi has a nickname, and the nickname is the Warm Heart of Africa because the people from Malawi are incredibly friendly and kind. Well, the man, his name was Derek, said to me, you've probably noticed that I haven't come to your chapel to any of your services. And I said, Derek, I actually did notice that you didn't come. And he said, let me tell you why. He said, when I was 10 years old, I went to a school run by Christian missionaries, and it was seven miles from our home, and it was a walk through the jungle to get to our home, to the school, run by the Christian missionaries. And one day, at school, another young boy my age did not do his lessons, nor had I done mine. So the teacher asked us to stay after school. So we stayed after school and he said, as your punishment for not doing your lessons, you have to dig a latrine now before you can go home. So these two 10-year-old boys dug a latrine up to their little shoulders. And when that pit was finished, the teacher came out and said, now don't you ever not do your lessons again. If you're going to go to this Christian school, you must follow our directions. And he told them they could go home. Derek proceeded to say that he walked home through the jungle, totally dark, with African wild animals, as you might imagine. And he said, I was scared to pieces. Seven miles I walked like this. As I neared my home, about a mile away, I could hear my mother crying out my name. She had been looking for me for hours with a baby strapped to her back with a piece of cloth. I ran to try to reach her, and as I did, I hit a stump that was coming out of the ground, and it tore open my leg. He pulled up his pant leg right there in the living room, this heart. And there was a deep scar, this wide, from his ankle all the way up to his knee. And then he looked at me in pause and he said, and that is why I do not go to your Christian chapel. What would you say? All I said was, I'm sorry, I put down my appetizers and my drink and I got my car and I drove away. Now the teacher in this school the Christian school had an understanding of the Christian faith as one where you must meet certain requirements, where you need to shape up or ship up. 
or you follow exactly what it says to do. And assert your power, which this Christian missionary did, his little boys. Now that kind of understanding is the same kind of understanding that John the Baptist had regarding how Jesus would operate. <clears throat> he thought Jesus would come in, tell people to shape up or ship out. He thought Jesus, in fact, would overturn the Roman authorities and kick them out of the land they were occupying. And he would be the ruler they would then follow. But what he got instead, at his baptism, as you heard the sin of reading just now, was the heavens opening up in a gentle dove coming down, landing on Jesus' head, hovering over his head, as a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, and symbolizing that this would be the style of his ministry, where he is not knighted to begin his ministry with a sword, I dub you, sir Jesus, who can carry out my mission in the church throughout the whole world. Instead, as Luther famously said, Jesus was introduced not with a sword or a blunderbuss. How often do you get to say that word? It's, it's like a musket, okay? Jesus was not introduced with a flash of sword or a sound of blunderbuss, but rather with a tiny dove. In these words, you are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. Words from Psalm 2, the royal coronation psalm. Well, then came a gentle minister. After that, healing the sick, casting out the demons, identifying the poor with the outcasts. It was totally not what John the Baptist, who would have people dig latrines, it's not what John the Baptist was expecting. And as a matter of fact, John the Baptist sent his own disciples to go to Jesus to ask him if he was really the Messiah because he didn't meet John's expectations. And what did Jesus say? You know, I've, I've said this before. You disciples of John, go back to John the Baptist and tell him what I really like. Old ladies are throwing away their walkers by the score. Deaf people are directing sympathies. And guys who just got out of prison are directing the road. Things have changed. Jesus had a different agenda, one of healing, one of grace. Now that is the first thing that came to my mind on Wednesday afternoon, the day of the Epiphany. The most important thing that happened on Wednesday was not the shouting mob of insurrectionists with their big, deep, bass voices sounding all tough, threatening our democracy, desecrating our sacred people's house. No, that was not the most important thing. The most important thing that happened on Wednesday was our epiphany, remembrance, of Jesus coming as a little baby in the stable, before whom kings would not assert their authority, but before whom kings would bow down. And on this day, the first Sunday after the epiphany of the baby, we see Jesus' gentle, nonviolent ministry started, inaugurated by all things, by of all things, a bird, not a sword knighted him. Now, some people think that it's the, the sword, I dub you, Sir Jesus, that the Christian faith is about, worshiping a strong arm, Jesus. Don't you know people who fear the gospel? I'll bet you do. Don't you know people who say this? I hope I go to heaven. I think I've been good enough. What's that about? Am I weak or am I chaff? When we think that way, we are missing out on the word of God's love and gracious acceptance. When I think of what God is like, I look at examples around me in my daily living. Once in a while, I see a true example of what Jesus' ministry was like. One guy I think of is a guy named Sergei, the cab driver. My wife and I were in Armenia visiting our daughter, who was in Armenia with her husband for a couple of years, and we spent a month there, and every day Sergei was outside our park waiting to take us around. He would drive us around in a beat-up Russian Lada car with the steering wheel all taped together with electrical tape, stuffing coming out of the seats, 
broken wind windshields. He had to move one of the windshield wipers with his hands. But he was an architect. One day he took us to seven or eight different monasteries and sacred places in Armenia, the first established Christian country in the whole world. It's south of Turkey, west of Iran. At every place, he made sure we saw the most holy places, the most beautiful churches. And along the way, he would buy food for us. He would fix us tea. We didn't speak a word that he spoke. He didn't speak words that we spoke. But he did say, come with me. And we walked up this narrow valley. And up this narrow valley, we saw a plaque. And there was some English under the plaque. And it said, a commemoration of the river of blood. When hundreds of Armenians were among the 1.5 million slaughtered in 1915 to 1970 in the first genocide, he stood there, our, our shepherd, crossing himself over and over and over, pointing to the words so we would make, make sure we would understand the sacrifice that was made by people who suffered from the hands of those who would take up arms and violence. I think of him as one of the examples of Jesus' path for us to follow. He wasn't good Jesus, but he embodied the words we hear from the prophet Isaiah. Listen to them. Do not fear, I have redeemed you. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you walk through fire, you will not be burned. When your democracy is threatened, I will sustain you. When all hell seems to be breaking loose, I will give you a vision of a heavenly kingdom here on earth. You are precious in my sight. I hope you can see this central understanding of the gospel. Do not fear, especially do not be afraid of Jesus. Remember him born weak in a stable and crucified on a cross. And remember him walking on the road to Emmaus so that he could share his own body and blood with the disciples following his resurrection. Today we remember him going into the water, a carpenter, and coming out a savior. He didn't need to be baptized, right? He didn't need the forgiveness of his sins. He was sinless. Why did he do it? He did it so that he could identify with us, share our humanity, become one with us, show us the fullness of life that he was offering to us. So we try to follow, not out of fear, but out of doubt. Jesus' identification with us. What does it mean? Oh, I think it means this. I, I think of the great Hindu leader, Mahatma Gandhi. He lived in South Africa for 20 years before moving back to India. And in this Indian community in South Africa, he was seen as a father figure, a magistrate. One day, a single mom brought her teenage boy to Mahatma Gandhi so he could straighten up the boy because the boy ate too much candy. She, did. she said, Mahatma Gandhi, tell my boy to stop eating so many sweets. Mahatma Gandhi didn't say anything. He sat there and finally he said, come back next week on this day. And the next week, she came back and she said, Mahatma Gandhi, tell my son to stop eating so much sugar. He didn't say a thing. He looked and he said, come back in another week on the same day. It happened the third time. She said, tell my boy to stop eating so many sweets. Mahatma Gandhi said, looking at the boy, he said, stop eating so much sugar. Why did it take you three visits? You didn't say it the first week, you didn't say it the second week, and finally you said it on the third week. And Mahatma Gandhi said, I did not know how hard it would be for me to give up sugar. <laughs> Isn't that great? Well, and I think of Gandhi's identification with boy as a, as a parable for God's identification with us. When Jesus was baptized, it is as if God said, I needed to realize how difficult it would be to give up being God only so that I could become one of you and know your life and offer you hope. In these challenging days, I encourage you, to look for people who've had that message of a gentle love and acceptance. And then you can be inspired by their lives. 
Two years ago when I wasn't doing a dinner, I was at a church, and during the beginning of the service, a friend of mine walked in, a retired pastor. He, he and his wife walked in with another couple. And they were a bedraggled looking couple. And during the service, he would point up the boat to where we were, and the couple would follow along. He'd, he'd get up and take them to communion, and he'd say, here's where you stand, here's how you put your hands up, here's where you kneel, here's how you receive the wine. Then he'd walk them back. Afterwards, he introduced them to me after the service as his friends. I said, afterwards, when we were home, I said, who are those people? He said, well, they're people I met at the homeless shelter last night, and I wanted to bring them along to church this morning. He said, they're my friends. Since then, I've seen his wife's Facebook post. She goes to Knight's Inn and brings food. She takes people to doctor's appointments. She provides travel around the town. Always, she never refers to these people as the homeless people. She says, I have new friends in Racine. Wow. I'm blessed to have people who know this understanding of people who have a Jesus identification with all of us deep within their hearts. We never have to be afraid of anyone. We can continue a life of faithfulness, calling all people, my brothers, my sisters, even the reprehensible, violent ones, whom Jesus told you and me to love. Finding a way somehow to give a message of peace and grace, the hallmarks, peace and grace of Christian living. About three weeks ago, no, it was more than that, a month ago, we got a, a baked goods delivered to us from friends in Madison, a friend in Madison, and my wife and I were sad because this woman and her husband, we, we're, we're a couple, we'd always get together with every Christmas, but her husband died of esophageal cancer a couple years ago. He died in the most brave way, and I told you some of you this at a public service this summer. He said, I'm tired of having all this, um, these lines going in. I'm tired of having all these uh, treatments. I want to have it all ceased. Pull the plug. Unhook me. Take out the tubes. He wrote this all down. He was on breathing tube. The doctors told him that he would die if they did that. He said, I know that. What I'd like that for is I'd like to have my priest come. He's a pistol I'd like to have my priest and a couple friends. And four friends came. And they were about to celebrate communion. And the doctor asked him again, are you sure you want to do this? He said, yes, I do. They pulled out his breathing tube so that he could talk. They unhooked all the lines. They gave him communion. And as he was dying, he said to one of their friends, he said, Mary Ann, be sure to call Betty, who I pick up for church on Sunday, and tell her I won't be able to take her to church. <laughs> In that wonderful, kind, faithful, loving way, we are able to see the essence of Jesus' ministry. Do unto others that she would have them do unto you. That's not a violent message. That is a loving message. Now, if it takes Sammy the cab driver, my friend in Madison, worrying about who's going to take Betty to church the next morning, if it takes these kind of people, God name, without his sugar, my friend who loves the homeless as his brothers and sisters, all we can do is thank God and put into our lives a model Christian behavior. Most of all, we give thanks there is one who welcomes us, always welcomes us, without criticism, without condemnation, and says, I can turn your life around. You have been baptized. I can make you clean. I can make you well. I can make even you, even Samuels, a holy person. I can give you a new start, as Mia gets a new start today. As we think of our waters of baptism, as she will remember hers. And as we live with this new rebirth together, we can say, be not.
made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the church throughout the world and its leaders, that guided by the Holy Spirit, they might proclaim your acceptance through the forgiveness of sins. Lord, in your mercy. For a peace in our country and for a thoughtful leadership in days of transition, that we might have an increase in hope and confidence in the leaders you guide. Lord, in your mercy. For the nations of the world and their leaders, for laborers busy both day and night, for the peacemakers amid strife, that you might inspire all people to use their strength wisely. Lord, in your mercy. For students returning to school in these days, for people starting new work, and for those forming new relationships, that they might be filled with a sense of hope, as well as enjoyment of the opportunities provided in our daily living. Lord, in your mercy. For the sick and those who provide medical care, especially those treating COVID patients and those making emergency visits to the hospital, for the imprisoned and those who show them mercy, for the lonely and those who provide companionship, for all who suffer from illness, especially Larry, Frank, Richard, Dan, Jan, Swanee, Kyle, Sherry, and others we name in our hearts. that you might send healing and compassionate care through your servants. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. For Dr. Martin Luther Church, as we seek your guidance in looking for a new pastor, as we welcome visitors and children and new friends, as we try to be the place of renewal in challenging times, that all the beloved of God might experience grace and peace Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. For Pastor Steve, as he supports all of us at Dr. Martin Luther Church in this time of transition, continue to guide him with your wisdom and infinite love. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Do. We do not bring the wine because of safety concerns, but we do have individually packaged wine that you, they pick up as you exit the church in the portico area. And we ask for God's blessing upon all of this at this time. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same manner also, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. share the body of Christ. When we drink this cup, we share the blood of Christ. Reveal yourself to us, O oh Lord, in the breaking of bread as once you revealed yourself to the disciples. You may be seated with the river of
our Savior Jesus Christ, which you have now received, strengthen you and preserve you with life everlasting. Amen. Christ Jesus, at this table, we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet nourished in body and in spirit to proclaim your good news and serve others in your name. Amen. May the love of God enfold you. May the grace of God uphold you. The light of God surround you. And may the power of God be with you and all those you love and with those whom you do not yet love, this day and forevermore, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.